Some people have said there's been a little neglect of the technology topic this morning. We were joking about how in the healthcare industry you probably wouldn't have a conference that's gone the whole morning without a discussion of technology. So we have a number of uh, distinguished individuals here today that are going to help us dig into some of the issues around the topic. And uh, before we dive in, I want to do a little bit to make this personal and ask everyone here to say what drew them to the topic of this panel. We have Shantanu Prakash from Educom in India, Roy Gilbert from Rocket, Steve Fereng from Encompass, Seth Reynolds from the Parthenon Group, and Ron Huberman from Venture Partners in Chicago. Um, so please, Seth, what brought you here? Uh, at the risk of being flippant, what actually brought me here was a stomach bug uh, for <laughs> Tammy, who you can see, Tammy Badalino, my partner at Parthenon, who you uh, can see in the uh, program is both uh, taller and more attractive than I am, so I will step in for her. But it's actually a, a, this topic of technology and education and uh, what, I, what I'll call next generation learning is one that I come to from a variety of different perspectives and am both at the same time very excited and optimistic about, but uh, similarly, very pessimistic as well. Uh, so, on the on the one side, I come at it as a uh, board member of a charter school, a parent, uh, and a um, as someone that works with uh, K-12 schools and vendors into those schools a lot. And I see incredible promise for really personalized learning uh, to drive incredible improvements in productivity and education. Um, on the flip side, having worked with those K-12 school districts and those vendors who bang their heads trying to get into uh, uh, these places, I, I come reasonably pessimistically uh, that things move incredibly slowly in this industry. Uh, in particular, and I'll, I'll be coming a lot of the time from a K-12 perspective, it's a little different on the higher ed, but, but not incredibly uh, more, more quick. Things move really slowly, and it's, it's hard to see in the near future how you're going to have change at scale unless some some things change, uh, so we can talk a little bit about that today. I'm sure we will. Thanks, Steve. Uh, you know, it, what, my, on a personal standpoint, the first thing that always intriguing technology is I have uh, a 16-year-old daughter who <laughs> owns a cell phone and has owned it, and uh, I don't think she's ever made a call on the <laughs> cell phone. I mean, she's literally, you know, they use it differently, and, and you, you, you use the perspective of technology of how our younger generation and the expectations that that they're going to have, and, and how does that tie into higher education? You see this new dynamic and this new consumer, uh, new student that's coming in, um, and really, uh, uh, I think we have to be able to understand that they're coming expecting uh, that level of type of engagement because that's how they, uh, right or wrong, uh, that's how they engage um, today. And then I think the second thing that I'm 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 just fascinated about is just the multitude of devices that are coming at us and the speed they're coming at us, you know, with the iPad, um, you know, with education and how do you tie that into mobile devices, how do you integrate that, you know, into all of the new tools and technologies that are there because we can hide from it and we can say you can't learn on it or you can't engage on it or you can't, but the reality of it is we have, we have to figure out how we as an industry can get the things that we think are challenged in online, how do we transform that into an engaging experience using these tools? And I think that's kind of what the dialogue needs to be. Great, Roy. Uh, so, like Roy said, uh, I, uh, I'm Roy Gilbert, and uh, I was this, I'm the CEO of Grocket. And there's really a couple of events which have led me here in this focus on education technology. Um, I, before I was at Grocket, I was at Google for a long time. Um, and even before that, my, I grew up in a family where both sisters and both my parents were public school teachers. So I'm something of the disappointment in the, uh, in the family. Um, but while I was at Google, um, my, uh, my family and I lived in India for about three and a half years. And I, I saw my wife, through kind of a complex set of events, take over and run a, um, a, a government school in the local slum. Um, and so I think even more so than just seeing the power of technology uh, to lever and to cause incredible change in education, uh, I got to see firsthand how entrepreneurial behavior uh, can make an incredible impact um, in a community or a state uh, and a country. And so uh, in many ways that inspired my interest and, and led me to be here today. Thank you. Ron. Right. 
you know, I spent the bulk of my career as a Chicago police officer. <laughs> and I ended up first in education trying to solve the issues I saw as a cop um, for a lot of years on Chicago streets. I came to this panel on technology because uh, having been the CEO and superintendent of the Chicago public school system, I at least came to the realization probably about a year into it that the greatest lever for change that we have that is the most underutilized lever is technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's why I'm here. Great. Thank you. Shantanu. Uh, thank you, Roy. And when you run an education business in a country like India, which has mammoth, colossal problems in education, just in terms of the sheer numbers of students that don't go to school and that need to be impacted, you really have no option but to use technology, essentially to do two things. A, drive down the cost of education so that you can induce mass consumption, which is, a, which is not so much of a challenge, I think, in North America, but in emerging markets, we see that as a single uh, biggest challenge, how to make education more affordable. And the, the second thing would be, how do you use technology as a great uh, lever for change to bring about disruptive impact? So some of the biggest problems that I see us facing in the Indian education ecosystem have been successfully impacted by technology. For instance, the problem of how do you make teachers more productive? Uh, so my, the company that I run, Educom, has, has a product that currently reaches out to about 5 million students with proven uh, teacher productivity uh, levels that have been achieved. Or for instance, uh, in a country where there are very few good teachers, how do you scale the teacher itself? Right. And again, we've seen technology make a very uh, a major impact. So in an emerging market uh, like India, it's not really an option whether you want to use technology. I think you have no option but to use it. So we certainly have enormous education needs. This whole conference is devoted to this issue. There is, on this topic of technology and education, the sense of a phenomenal and fast-changing infrastructure for the dialogues and the data that are integral to learning and education, pervasive broadband, a rich device ecology is being talked about here, smartphones, netbooks, many innovations to be leveraged, cloud computing, software as a service, social networks, multimedia for learning, simulations, multiplayer games. So maybe we have a opportunity to connect teaching and learning and assessment in a continuously improving system that provides learning pathways adapted to the needs and interests of every learner. This is called out as a, as a vision in the National Education Technology Plan. And yet today there's a real disconnect in how kids are learning in their lives with searching and texting on mobiles, on the web, with YouTube, and the realities of their classrooms. So what do you think? Are we at a point of transformation for education enhanced by technology? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. Why? Yeah. So we, you know, my my company, uh, Embedded Compass, uh, helps. Uh, we're in the higher education. We help uh, not-for-profit uh, universities and college launch degrees 100% uh, online, and we work with schools, um, you know, like a USC and Vanderbilt and George Washington, and and you see traditional schools um, like that, um, you know, really kind of starting to. Um, you utilize the technology to be able to expand and access new audience of, of uh, students. You know, historically, they had to walk into the building. They had a, you know, they had a great faculty. They had this, um, and I think there's, there's been this realization, uh, you know, over the last couple years that, you know, that, that, the, that the accessibility to their brand and their education um, is needed today. And I think the second, the second realization that um, the not-for-profit um, universities are dealing with is, is you know, they, they, they sometimes are viewed in innovation with the research, but then when you get into the technology, um, they sometimes just want to have the shiny tool. I want to I have the shiny object, and I want to buy the shiny thing. And one of the things that I think that, that the technology be able to do is how do you integrate um, the technology to exactly what's going on in the classroom? Because I think too many times people just want to have the shiny tool and here, here's, a, here's an iPad and go, go increase learning. But the reality of it is, is that how do you, to the, to the closest your ability, get the same experience that you, you got on ground as you got online? And I think with the tools that are out there and that have come in the last you know, few years, if you think about you know, FaceTime, I mean, you think about now you know, dialing the phone and you know, there you are with video. And so 
there was always this argument, well, I have to see your face to know you're getting it. Well, okay, now, now there's, there's, a, there's an app for that, I guess. Is, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you, you think about, um, you know, the learning management systems that are there and the integration of social media. So always, there always was this argument in higher education that, you know, well, great, you're going to deliver content, but how do you collaborate with content? And so, great, delivering is easy right now. You just go on the internet and you can deliver and I can get it. But, but the reality in education is really about how you collaborate about the content. Mm -hmm. So now with, the, with social media and, and the, the aspects that are going, that, that have taught us how to collaborate online in a, really, in a real meaningful way, not just a superficial way. Um, what I, I heard that a fourth of all you know, marriages have come from online dating services. That's a meaningful way of connecting on an online basis. So I think universities, are now adapting and, and, and really realizing that technology isn't just a shiny tool. The technology right. is really one of those things that actually can enhance the learning um, within their students. And just here, a, I've uh, got Seth and Ron. Okay. Sorry, just, uh, you bring up integration, and I think there's probably a lot of people who are longer veterans of the K-12 technology world than I am, but... Uh, Lightspan, CCC, a few We've been at tipping points a lot of times. We've been at transformation points a lot of times in the past. And so why would this one be any different? Well, there are some aspects that might make that. But I think unless you get that integration, and it's not just tools. And so how do you get that? Well, right now we talk about all the entrepreneurs that are in the audience. I, I think, and it's a semantic issue, but I think we ought to call them vendors. Because where you need real entrepreneurship is actually the people that own the delivery mechanism of the, in the school. So the folks who can actually drive an innovative delivery model should be the entrepreneurs. The problem is we're having all the innovation happen outside the system, and it gets layered on top of a system that's still traditional. Until you have the entrepreneurship happen inside the system, that's when you're going to have those folks shape the demand and say, I need tools, the shiny tools, but now I'm getting a shiny tool not for the shiny tool's sake, but because it helps me do something very different. Either it provides me information that helps me personalize things in ways that I've never been able to do. Information that allows me to Im continuously improve what I'm doing. Or it provides me a delivery me mechanism that, that enables me to you know, release a constraint of time, mm -hmm. space, or most likely human capital. And so if you do that, but that's where I'm pessimistic, because where we don't see much of that, certainly on the K-12 side, it's, it's very slow to change that core delivery model. We keep on bringing great new entrepreneurship from the outside in. You see a little more of it, I think, at the higher ed level, where the dollars follow the student, and, the, and the comp that, that dynamic competitive market is at least a little more uh, robust. Well, whether we call it entrepreneurship or something else, effective implementation of technology in, in education is a fundamental issue, right? It's not just the design of the artifact, it's really the social practices around it that make it work. And so when we see ra randomized clinical trials and other studies of technology and education, often there's, an, uh, there's not attention to this issue of variability and implementation that goes along with the design intentions. Yep. You know, I also think we could talk about just some macro trends in K-12, but I'm gonna jump in really quick with implementation collaboration. I guess where I was stuck as a school superintendent was where you had unengaged, poor human quality, all the collaboration tools, all the tools that try to aid the teacher wouldn't fundamentally solve the problem, right? And so there was a fundamental question of who, what guides instruction? Does technology guide instruction? Or does a teacher guide instruction utilizing technology, right? And depending on the quality of the teacher, at least in my opinion, would answer that question. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that degree of analysis of the teacher quality relative to the technology is utilized. Right, but poor human quality, you need to use technology in a very different way than a high-functioning teacher um, can work. Macro trends, I think, that are occurring that are going to push this as quickly as K-12 might move in our country and hopefully faster. School districts are completely broke. Right, if you use Chicago as an example this year, they're a billion dollars in the hole. So there's a fundamental problem where human capital dollar solutions simply are not affordable. And given the pension situation, I don't see a future in the next decade where they become affordable, yeah. right? So technology, in a way, has to begin to fill a gap because the traditional dollars that might have been there are simply not there. I think from a macro perspective, there's always also greater acceptance that the systems we have are failing, and so there's great need for change. Mm -hmm. And so you've got broke systems, people accepting more and more that those systems are broke. 
And then I would say the third macro trend is that technology is less scary. Technology is something that now everyone has in their home. Everyone has email. The traditional di digital divide as we knew it, which is families with computers and families without computers, is, in my opinion, in my experience in, in some of the toughest neighborhoods in Chicago, substantially broken down. Right? The new digital divide is access to high quality online education tools outside of school versus not having those. Mm -hmm. So at the macro level, there's this acceptance that's broken. There's school districts who are going to have to simply find a more cost-effective way to educate kids because they won't be able to do it with the traditional pieces. And finally, I think there's a growing acceptance that while we all accept the human capital is the answer, right? We fundamentally need better teachers and better school leaders in order to have better outcomes. That solving that equation of recruiting the, the smartest kids who are coming out of colleges to go into education in a fundamental, sustained way, to find a way to exit the teachers that are ineffective, is a problem we will not solve anytime soon. If you put all that together, I think it comes to the conclusion that technology is a key part of that answer. And one micro trend I would talk a little bit about that was Chicago specific, but I think it would be true for every urban school district in America, which is if you ask this question from an analytical point of view, which is what percentage of the students in your average classroom are you moving at their horizon? Are you truly moving at their ability to learn? Mm -hmm. And we instituted in all third through ninth grade classrooms in Chicago a growth assessment three times a year to know exactly how much kids are growing. Well, we learned things from that data that we didn't expect to learn. And one of the things that we learned that if you take a look at the average Chicago public school classroom and you look at the lowest performing kid and you look at the highest performing kids and you map out where they are, it comes to the conclusion that the teacher who's teaching those kids has to differ differentiate instruction into four different segments in order to have any hope of moving the bulk of those kids at the horizon, right? No matter how gifted and talented and engaged a teacher is, they cannot differentiate instruction of a class of 25 to 30 kids in four different places. I believe that also ultimately leads one to a conclusion that technology gives you the best opportunity to move as many kids as close to the horizon of their ability to learn as possible. How that's done is complicated, how you get um, K-12 leadership to accept this as part of the future are tough things, but I think it's one of those things that is not, will we get there, right? It's not the question. The question is when we will get there and how we'll get there. So, so Ron pointed to, to something which is key to our business. And so, you know, Grocket is a consumer business. We're focused on using social, online social interactions to help people prepare for educational milestones and professional development. But we sell to consumers. We sell to students and we sell to parents. Um, we don't talk to school districts at all. Uh, even though we're probably needed there, partly because uh, our team of, of 25 engineers and technologists are not up to the task of trying to change public education and fix school districts in a meaningful way, which is kind of sad, uh, but it's also an opportunity as well. But where technology has a place uh, in school districts and where it will be embraced is where technology can uh, dramatically increase productivity and scale. Um, I think that the opportunity to have the best teachers uh, get more opportunity to teach larger numbers of students, uh, to enable you know, the best content and the best school districts to reach more students at a time, that is going to be one of the key levers for technology change. Uh, if, if you can just take the top 75% of teachers, not the top half, not the top 10%, but just the top 75% of teachers and give them the resources and the tools necessary uh, to teach you know, 100% of students today, uh, that would bend the curve in an enormously positive way in education today. I don't think it's a problem that, that my company is going to solve this year, um, but I think that is one of the key opportunities for technology, and especially for, you know, social media. To provoke a bit, um, I've heard said lately a lot uh, that the frontal teaching model is dead as a primary vehicle for education. Uh, that there are many new alternatives that employ technologies that change the role of teachers uh, from being uh, the sage on the stage. And I wonder what your own experience is in thinking about that, what new designs there are that can combine the best in school and out of school learning experiences, for example. If I could speak to this very briefly, because, because again, like part of, of what we do as a company is uh, in some cases could be perceived as disintermediating the teacher in front of a classroom method. We think that social learning is more effective in many ways than teacher in front of a classroom. But I think with the, the, the possibilities for technology to make that teacher in front of the classroom reach many, many more people and not be constrained by buildings, you know, 
pay structures, districts, where you are in the country, uh, or even the just the concept of when and, and, and what time you teach. So I think that there, I, I think we'll always need the, the gifted expert. Sometimes that gifted expert may be your peer in a classroom, but I think many times that gifted expert is the highly trained, highly accomplished teacher, and there's opportunities for technology to, to allow them to spread their message much farther. I, I will, um, I think in the format that it's, that just the traditional chalk and talk, I think will be dead, if, if not already um, dead. I think I, my brother's a teacher in uh, eighth grade, and he was. There, they were told at the high school or the uh, junior high, you can't bring in cell phones and you can't bring in iPads. And well, this kid, when he was speaking, was typing things in, and he would speak, and he'd ask questions, and and. Uh, and then he would, uh, you know, give an answer, and the stu student was really engaged. And all of a sudden, he kind of, my, my brother noticed at one point, uh, he was using, asking questions on the iPad and, and uh, you know, kind of looking on the internet about, you know, kind of debating. And, and he was really interactive. And my brother said, put that away. Put that back in your backpack. <laughs> so the student puts that back in the backpack. And from that moment on, student disengaged. <laughs> was done with the conversation. No interaction with the faculty. And, and so I think there are ways that you can take technology and the usage of it and not lower the demand of, of having a, a, mm -hmm. a, a you know, world-renowned faculty to give the, the, the information that they have, the learnings that they can have to build the collaboration, but the reality of it is, is that we should be able to challenge our faculty and challenge what they're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes there's so much information at our fingertips, we don't have to just think about it, we can go find it. And, we can, and then now you're talking not about the content, but you're debating the content and mm -hmm. because the content is there. So I would argue that um, you know, it, it, it should be dead in terms of just that, because I think there's technology should be done um, in, in, in every, every classroom setting. Shantanu, do you want to pick up on that? Sure. I, I disagree. I think the frontal teaching model is clearly not dead, because all over the world, we are building more schools. There are, there are huge pockets that are underserved today. India, for example, is shot by 200,000 schools. Are we at that point of technology that e-learning can start replacing schools? I don't think that's the consensus with educators and policymakers around the world. I think the question that needs to be asked is, is the frontal teaching model effective? Mm -hmm. So I guess there are two trends here mm -hmm. that will clearly shape the future of the frontal teaching model. A, how do you make the teacher in the classroom more productive? Because it's about deriving a greater ROI from the societal investments in the frontal teaching model. B, how do you supplement the frontal teaching model with what you do outside of the school with students? And I think that is where technology is going to play an extremely disruptive role. And the reason it's going to play a disruptive role, because for the first time, Earlier, it's always been about the promise of technology. Now is the time, I think we are seeing an inflection point where it is about that all the pieces seem to be coming together. The devices, the, the learning platforms, uh, all pervasive broadband and so on. You must keep in mind that for a student to get distracted by technology is very easy. If you do not provide a compelling learning experience, a student is not naturally motivated to learn math and science. He's naturally motivated to play a game, to, to hang out with friends and so on. So you have to compete for the student's time and attention in, in the learning framework with other things that he likes to do. And, and, and therefore, technology has a higher standard that it has to answer to. But it's all coming together. So I think the model, the frontal teaching model is not dead, but we need to supplement the frontal teaching model with very powerful, immersive, use of technology to create a great learning experience for the child. So, I mean, as the resident pessimist on the panel, I, I would say it's clearly not dead. Walk into most schools and that's what you'll see, not just in K-12, but in higher ed as well. Um, should it, sh is it effective, I think, is the right question. And I think calling it a model is probably, it, it should be dead as a model. It's not going to be dead, nor should it be as a mode. Uh, you know, it, 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 uh, to borrow, you know, School of One has come up a number of times, and, and uh, I think it's a, a great example where people think of it as a technology solution, and it's actually an information technology solution, and I think more of the value comes on the information side than the technology side. And the technology is used as appropriate 
as a mode of delivering instruction, but so is live instruction, both in large group, small group, individual. So I think if we think about it not as the model, but as a tool, mm -hmm. just like other tools could be there, mm -hmm. then it's, it's actually not only not dead now, but it probably won't die out completely. The issue is how do you bring those other tools to bear to make a model that is in, entirely more productive I, and I think effective. the key of engagement is very important here because if you take a look at the average high school student in America, right, that has access to lots of technology, and this is not a rich or poor issue when it comes to the smartphone. So you can walk into any of the poorest na neighborhoods across America and uh, kids have smartphones, right? They're texting, they're surfing the web in different ways. So there's this learned skill of multitasking all the time, right? All of us do it. You can no longer sit through a speech. Everyone is itching to get to their iPhone, Blackberry, right? Because we need the stimulus of other information. The students that we're educating ultimately are functioning the same way if not some square of what we're doing relative to that engagement. So the concept that you're going to put a teacher in front of students teaching at a whiteboard or a blackboard without some kind of real-time multitasking opportunities for the students to engage similar to how they live their life outside that classroom, you end up with a much greater disengagement that you may have, uh, that you may have reached historically because now they're living their life one way outside of class, they walk into class and they're saying things have to slow down and fundamentally change which disengages students. So whether it's the teacher in the front of the classroom or the, teacher, uh, the teacher's lesson being facilitated through technology or collaborating, whatever that ultimately looks like, we also have to be accounting for the way that kids view the world today and how they function and what goes on in the classroom and the fact that that disconnect is growing and will only continue to grow. I throw one, one, one um, I always think technology um, you know, makes things go faster. Right, so let's. So that means technology will make a bad process worse, um, or a good process better. And I think this is a little bit what you, you keep bringing up. And and too many times, you know, bringing out technology, if you don't have the right fundamentals and foundation, mm -hmm. um, it'll make it worse. The experience for the student will be um, worse. And we always have a, a philosophy, kind of a step that two things is you automate it manually first. So automate it. See it manually, walk through it manually, of how, and then think about the outcome in mind. What do, you want, what do you want to get at the very end? What's your outcome in your classroom? What kind of learnings do you want to do? And then the discussion is, what's the best way using the technology to get to that outcome? And I think the, the failure of some, whether it's K-12 or, or higher education, it's, I bought this tool, and now I'm told by somebody to go put it in my classroom. Right. And you're like, well, how, now you try to use work all night, you figure out how do I put this iPad tool in here, and how I get this LMS, but the reality of it is that's the, that's the wrong way. You need to think about what, what are you trying to accomplish. Um, I had a uh, prospective client way back when who says, we're going we're to put Second Life in all of our uh, classrooms. And I thought, why? I mean, what does that have to do with any of the learning mm -hmm. outcomes that you're trying to get out of the classroom. You just want to have Second Life in there because it's, I, I guess it's cool. I've, I've never been on it. But, um, so I think that's the change in using technology because there's so many things thrown at higher education and so many tools and in K-12, we all kind of think we have to go give every student an iPad and we've solved all of our problems. Well, we didn't solve all our problems because there's no connection to what that really is going to do to improve learning in the classroom. So, um Teachers, it seems, in any foreseeable future are going to continue to be a vital part of the education system, even if learning's happening uh, out of school, among peer groups, and so on. What do you see uh, happening in relation to either using uh, technology to help teachers learn better how to use technology in the classroom, or in providing them with the knowledge that they need to be able to use the powers of technology to support learning? I, before I answer, I just want to give some quick background to, to, to the answer is that uh, about a month ago, uh, our company sponsor was called a Startup Weekend for Education. We invited a lot of teachers and engineers together to work on you know, applications or systems that could enhance teaching, enhance education. And we did this over like a weekend, locked everybody in our office. We did not tell our landlord about it. And uh, fed them a lot of pizza, and then uh, they built applications around it. At the at the end of the week, I guess about ten presentations, six of them concerned ways to make teachers better and ways to evaluate teachers better. 
Uh, every, every team that had um, at least two teachers on it came up with some sort of application that allowed you to hire and screen teachers more effectively. Um, which was really amazing that I thought the teachers would come up with ways to sort of like share content better or you know, make their jobs easier. Instead, they just want better peers. Like they just wanted to get more better teachers in the front door. And they had to do with you know, video, you know, lessons uh, or seeing you know, lessons on video, um, uh, being, able to, being able to assess and apply a rubric you know, across the entire school district very quickly. And they're really innovative, uh, innovative solutions. So I think that there's sort of this latent sense of we can do a better job just getting teachers on the front end. Um, and there's, there's plenty of ideas on, uh, on how to do this. So it's, it's interesting. It's, a, it's a, not something that we're working on particularly, but it, it's obvious there's a lot of enthusiasm for fixing it. Yeah, you know, the other way to think of technology is we're very focused on the teacher, which ultimately in many ways makes sense. But there's also a lack of management in K-12 mm -hmm. utilizing any information. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the first piece of this puzzle in many ways, I don't think needs to ultimately start with the teacher, but needs to start with management. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that from the perspective that if you take a look at, I always use the McDonald's analogy, right? If you take a look at the average public school system in America, and you walk in and you say, how are your kids doing? There's one standardized test that the state will issue once a year to try to determine the, the growth of those kids and how much uh, learning is occurring from an absolute perspective, right? By the time the teacher can use that information, those kids have moved on to the next level. So I always say it's like walking into a McDonald once a year, opening the cash drawer and counting out the cash, and how much cash you have ultimately will tell you how well is that McDonald's doing. Not is it the burgers or the shakes that are selling better or what else is occurring. So fundamentally, with education, I think part of what we have to figure out is by utilizing this data to manage these enterprises, we're going to get a much bigger bounce first than actually trying to integrate things into the classroom. Because being able to differentiate and understand what students need, understanding what part of your workforce is delivering, um, which part of your workforce is not delivering. So as a quick example from Chicago's data where we put the growth assessment in, it shows that in essence, in summary, right, that 20% of the workforce is delivering zero growth for you, right? So if you were to have a number which is one over one would suggest one year of growth, okay. right, for one academic year, 20% of your workforce is delivering zero, right? So the first power of technology, and in Chicago it, it happens to be an online adaptive assessment three times a year for all kids, begins to give you a lever to pull that is pretty dramatic, right, which is what do you do about that 20% of your workforce? Mm -hmm. And anything you try to do with technology on the front end um, short of understanding what the analysis is on the back end of these enterprise systems, um, I think is going to lead to pretty bad results. So you've highlighted data, uh, which is uh, clearly one of the benefits that technology could bring, is data on a scale that we've never imagined if more and more learning and teaching transactions are mediated in some way by technology tools. Um, there's a whole new field of educational data mining that's growing. Um, learning analytics is, uh, is the new buzz phrase. People are even thinking about can you uh, sense whether a student's engaged from the expressions on their faces that you could read through video cameras on their laptops, a whole lot of speculative uh, work on that question. So when you think about data mining and learning analytics and you know, what a principal needs, what a teacher needs, what the learner themselves uh, need, where do you see kind of uh, breakthroughs or insights coming in that whole area of data? I would say it's, at least from my perspective, it's unbelievably fundamental, right? So it's not fancy facial recognition technology. It's that Mrs. Smith teaches terribly, right? <laughs> and her kids aren't learning, right? It's those basic levers that are going to drive improvement in, in, in education in our country, right? It's providing transparency and information to parents. I, I, I worry a little bit with technology because there's this great synergy of uh, social networking and collaboration and all this stuff, right? Which in other settings is working really, really well. The question is, how do you get it to work well in K-12? Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't get basic management right, the one-on-ones, then you're taking a fundamentally broken system and trying to layer in technology yeah. to fix what's fundamentally broken. So I think part of the realization of where we, the bucket that we should and shouldn't put technology in, right, is if you're going to put technology in to play air traffic control, Right, which I think is, in many ways is, see Joel Klein back there getting called out all day. School of One is that model in a way, at least the way that I see it, which is you have a system that's figuring out how do you move kids at the horizon? How do you maximize right, which teachers are most effective? How do you drive kids through a system that's going to make sure that they're learning? Right? You, that's a, almost a replacement model because it doesn't utilize a traditional system. 
almost every other technology that I've seen is somehow taking a traditionally, traditional system that's collectively understood to be broken and saying, let's, to your point exactly, layer some technology on that, and now we should expect big gains. And so part of, I think, the 101 of this is asking the question is based on how broken a particular system is and what the teacher quality looks like and what the assessment data of the kids are, is the role of the technology to usurp the teacher and have instruction done online with the teacher playing proctor, right, which in many cases I think will deliver great growth, versus do you have a higher functioning system where there's some learning going on and it becomes a facilitator mm -hmm. of that technology to learn faster. Understanding the underlying data of where growth is occurring in a, in, a, in a system and the quality of the teaching and the quality of the culture of that school determines that a lot. What you don't hear a lot about is a diagnostic, if you will, that says, why is that system broken? Which is kind of very much to your point. And if we know that that system's broken because Mrs. Smith, who teaches third grade math, doesn't know fractions herself, right? Then we have a very different problem and a different technology solution may help solve that. And just to add to that, I think to take your McDonald's, sorry, Shantanu, but just to take your McDonald's analogy a little further, there's the data that allows you to manage your, your employees and really understand sort of performance management data. And then there's the data that allows you to actually think about your customers and actually do real customer segmentation on your students. Start to figure out who, for whom is which product working? And it's not going to be the same thing for everyone. I, mm -hmm. I know Chicago's done this. New York has done this at the K-12 level. I think uh, some of the for-profit universities have been you know, out in front of looking at the data of their student performance and really learning how to continuously improve the product mm -hmm. so it does better at whatever outcome they're trying to, they're trying to get. And that's the, that's the real promise, I think, in the shorter term before you get to all the, all the sort of delivery mechanism pieces. So is this mass customization notion one of the things that's different about the technology today? I think, um, I think to, so take a little bit on the data, what, what makes it different. So there's two, there's two aspects that I think the data that I think is challenged, challenged to get real good data in a, in a traditional brick and mortar, and that's you know, true assessment and then true engagement. So I can, I can look at the audience and you're sitting in a chair, but I don't have a clue whether you're listening or not, you're thinking about something else, mm -hmm. you're you know, having different conversations, but in online, because you can capture every click, you can capture every discussion, you can capture interactions with the faculty, with students, you can capture so much data that it really showcases, in, in my, you know, obviously biased uh, opinion, you can really kind of um, get a great feel of how engaged the students are in learning. Because you can, you can track how they are doing um, and where they are going, and then if you have, you know, if it's K-12 or if you have, you know, other programs that maybe have at-risk students, it certainly can trigger early indicators of that risk. And there's clear uh, data that can showcase that they didn't do, they did this every time, and now they change that. The second data or technology is assessment. So, you know, how do we assess that the learning is going on? And and it's, you know, I've you know, been in higher education, both in for-profit and, and, and talk to not-for-profits now, and it's one of the challenges that all, you know, institutions um, are, you know, how do they every day in, in kind of institutional assessment, how do they measure that improvement? And I think in the technology is one way, if you give the students access to it, even if it's a, front, a classroom like this, you can still give them access to technology to understand really where the touch points of learning and assessments going on, so you can measure that in a more effective way, rather than it's a more subjective uh, right. measurement. Shantanu, did you have something to add on the? You have millions of students that are involved in your yes, classrooms. Yes, we have. We have millions of students, and I have always been amazed by the ability for educators to take really big pedagogical decisions with very little amount of real data. Mm -hmm. And I think the, one of the challenges, uh, really it's a challenge and an opportunity at the same time, because now technology gives you that power um, to measure everything. So comprehensive, continuous evaluation, mm -hmm. I think is going to be the big mega trend. And that is really a big black hole today. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the newest research and some of the latest innovation that is happening on the assessment side is really about capturing the data and analytics on the data 
to ensure that both students and teachers know exactly where they stand. So if you look at a teacher as really the facilitator for the pedagogical experience in the classroom, so there are two things for the teacher that only technology can help do. A, what do we want from our teachers? We want that when they stand up in the classroom, they have access to all the best practices. They have the ability to map their own ability against best practices available. The only way you can do it is to unshackle the teacher from her local school district, the local community that she is currently in, and allow her a level playing field. And that's through collaborative learning, and that's through, through technology. Right. So to shift for a moment to policy framework in which you're doing your activities, um, are there ways you think that there are major policy barriers or also opportunities to accelerating K-12 education uh, with technologies? Policies that are in the way, policies that we need. I mean, you could imagine seat time. You could imagine cell phones being banned in schools being a problem, uh, among other things. I think Steve would highlight that one. As an example, uh, when I when I first joined Crockett, you know, we're we're selling into this one school district, and this actually is one of the many anecdotes that led me to believe that selling into school districts was probably a, a uphill and losing battle for us. Um, and after going through the entire demonstration, um, you know, went on site to the school district and found like our website and most of the interaction was blocked by like the the school board computers because you can't allow YouTube, you can't allow this, you can't allow Facebook Connect. And, uh, and that's when we realized that, you know, we're, rather than worry about the policy changes and worry about the policy framework, just run past it, bypass it, uh, and go directly to parents or to, to fast-moving institutions. And I think that's sad. Um, I, think it's, um, I, I, I think that in many cases, we would talk to teachers or talk to principals who would say, this technology is great. We would like to use it uh, in our classrooms today, but we will never be able to change our IT policies to make that happen. That's in. Also, we, would, we will never be able to make a decision to, to bring you in. Um, that's just, I think it's sad. But for us, rather than worry about it, we go to parents, and we go, we go just around the existing institution. I would actually uh, second that from an emerging markets perspective. Uh, I think the rest of the world is far less dependent on uh, regulatory policy uh, to induce demand. And I have seen time and again in countries like India, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, and so on, that if you can prove the value of the product and the technology to the parent, they are more than motivated to outlay a, a fairly significant part of their personal income towards consumption of education products and services. So really the challenge, the ball is back in the court of the companies and the entrepreneurs who are pushing the innovation using technology. They have to prove that the product works and the parents are ready to pay. And also it's a political problem, meaning you can have all the great entrepreneurs with all the innovation that won't sell to school districts or are educating kids, right? Which then relies, at least domestically in the United States, right? Um, that we're saying, oh, the learning's gonna have to occur through entrepreneurs helping that learning occur outside. So you look at the very core of what technology should do and how our regulatory and school systems are set up, right? So one is education, a good technology system, should move you, and I keep using this term, at your horizon. So it's a competency-based model, meaning you solve one lesson online, you should jump right to the next one. Our systems are still fundamentally set up on seat time right. and, and credits. And so that's a big disconnect in utilizing technology and moving kid at their fast, kids at their fastest. Then there's a whole other set of political regulation that has grown up with online innovation. So I will use Illinois as an example. In Illinois, uh, one of the things we wanted to offer in the Chicago Public School System is online mechanisms to allow kids to get lots of extra credits. Well, the law of the land in the state of Illinois is that you have to, in order to have a credit-bearing course, has to be taught by an Illinois certified teacher, right? Those type of laws and those type of regulations are not unique to Illinois. Almost every single state has those issues. So going back to what Cory Booker said earlier today, the, there's, there's no political will to even set up the regulatory framework that allows technology to be leveraged in a very successful manner in K-12 school districts. I think our ticket's going to have to be some heroic districts, and by heroic I mean highly competent districts that absolutely blow it out of the park, utilizing technology where they are far and above better than everyone else. And all of a sudden we have a model that utilized technology and changed the game. 
and did it on scale. If we had one of those to show effectively, right, then we would be able to move K-12 much faster in adoption. But I share a lot of your skepticism that in the current regulatory climate, given who the current leadership was of the average K-12 district, coming from school districts, given how school boards are elected, given the union relationships, this is something that is going to go very slowly and super smart guys in the room, right, who are doing this great work are not in school districts, they're all trying to figure out how do I make my buck around school districts, mm -hmm. right? And at least domestically, that's not gonna work to change the equation. So, yeah, just to add, uh, the, the regulatory framework does create a problem. I would note the unions take a bashing in this and they're, there's a, they're, they create problems, but there's a lot of things that school districts can do that they simply don't do for lack of imagination, for lack of capacity, for lack of boldness, uh, to, to put it politely. And I think, you know, to get those proof points is critical so that people feel some safety in numbers and going forward and do it. Uh, there's, there's much less, uh, there's upside for all the entrepreneurs in this room. The reason we don't see the entrepreneurs in, in, the, in the schools is it's mostly downside risk for them if they yeah. take a risk. So a couple other things just as barriers to pay attention to are, another one is rules around human capital. You know, class size requirements makes it very hard to try something really innovative where you've got, say, 90 kids in a lecture and then you know coaching and individualized stuff going on next to it. Um, the inability to have different roles, and that is, a, that is more of a union issue, is another one that's a problem. Uh, the other problem is how the funds flow. There's, there's tied to so many different input requirements mm -hmm. that it's very, mm -hmm. the, the money actually exists, but it's tied up in often human capital because of class mm -hmm. size requirements. It's tied up in, mm -hmm. this can only be used for this particular purpose, it can't be used for yeah. that purpose. Different it can only be used in this school, yeah. not in that school. And so that creates a problem as well. A, a couple that I don't think are on the radar screen as much, but are becoming to be, one is some of the stuff that education reformers themselves are doing could create problems for innovation down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, one would be assessments. So if we'd go to assessments that are basically on a year-by-year -year progression mm -hmm. and tie you know, big accountability to it, it becomes very hard to then move, it becomes even more hard uh, to become uh, competency-based. Mm -hmm. And then the other would be teacher evaluation. If you want to team teach, you know, if you want to have you know, four mm -hmm. teachers mm -hmm. and you know, five software programs attached to a particular kid, it gets hard to then say, well, what was the value add of this teacher? So those are good things that may have unintended consequences oh, at stifling innovation. That's fascinating. So we need to do some visionary thinking now. 2020, uh, a decade from now, what's the technology enhanced learning going to look like from your perspective? What will be the thriving business models? I mean, we haven't talked much about business model innovation, but among others, Shantanu here has, has done some uh, careful work on that. Um, how do you view the future a decade out, knowing that a decade back, none of us foresaw Google, YouTube, or anything like it? So. So let me take a, take a shot at that. And I think every company is already thinking five years, 10 years down the line. I think some of the cataclysmic changes that technology is going to bring about, one is, is going to be in this entire notion that the, the, the citizen of tomorrow is going to be much more of a global citizen. Mm -hmm. We all know that. So how is technology going to be able to help the student achieve that goal? So we are talking about massively scalable and collaborative learning platforms. Some of them are already emerging. And I think over the next few years, they will get far more traction. The second thing is really about, and I go back to your point about uh, the classroom model. Is that broken? I think it will break at some time in the future, not necessarily replaced. May get broken, but not necessarily replaced. Kids will still probably go to school a decade from now. But we will discover for the very first time the notion of individualized and personalized education that is going to be driven from a, a massive amount of data that is going to be captured literally on every click. And using that data in an intelligent way to create an immersive learning environment that is personalized for the student. And the student, therefore, also has a seamless experience in the classroom and outside the classroom. I think the whole notion of in-classroom and outside the classroom itself is probably going to get redundant with greater use of more immersive technologies. Mm -hmm. For example, gaming. I think it's going to become more fun to be able to learn. 
more fun to be able to collaborate, collaborate globally. I think some of those trends I can clearly see in the future. I think one <laughs> major technology trend, and it kind of goes back to your question about the, the frontal teaching method, is it going to be replaced? I mean, right now it'd be hard to argue that uh, an instructor in front of a classroom is, is less engaging than seeing someone on the computer with a tiny little screen on Skype. <laughs> um, but um, the, the, the basic trend in terms of online interactions is that online interactions are improving incrementally every day at a faster and faster rate, and the fidelity of your online interactions will eventually surpass the fidelity of the interaction of sitting here next to someone and talking to them. Um, when that happens, that is just like infinite scale immediately. And I don't know if it happens next month, I don't know if it happens next year, or if it's gonna take a decade, but I, I would posit that by 2020, uh, which is the time frame that you're, you're talking about, that we will, we will have a world where an interaction with, with one of Shantanu's News teachers in, in New Delhi uh, to California is, is just as rich, or perhaps richer, than me sitting in front of them just in a classroom. Uh, and when that happens, uh, the technological changes and the changes in terms of productivity in teachers and the changes in terms of acceleration of learning will be so dramatic that we cannot imagine it. I do think um, um, I would actually, you know, I, you know, traditional education, if in, in the higher, you know, it's taken a long time to get to where we are at today. So, you know, you think nine years, well, I think it took us 100 years to get to, you know, where we're, where we're at today. And we've made a lot of progress, I think, in, in, in integrating technology into um, our classroom. I think the key with me, we already see, you know, more bandwidth, Speed, you know, speed of mobile devices, you know, that all that does is it opens the door more for access to better, more richer HD quality types of content. I mean, the more you can you can actually speed up your your bandwidth or your mobile devices, it, it actually gives a richer experience. Where I think sometimes online students feel like, you know, the quality of that little video that I see is okay. I like you know. But I think as we look at the future of bandwidth and, and the speed, um, I think I believe that that will, and you, when you can it increases your HD quality of, of your video or, or whatever sort of mechanism um, that you hear. I think it's also this data that I can't underestimate the importance of it. You, I, as I was talked about, I think in the higher education uh, section, every one of us learns differently. We all take different paths to get to the end result. And in a classroom, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's difficult to, when you have a collection of people to get, because you have a one way of, of, of educating and you try to have collaboration to do that. And I think this whole customized uh, path um, to get into the uh, end result using data is, I think, the future. Where, you know, I didn't do well in this assignment, I didn't do well, you know, in this, and I, or I learned better this way, and the technology then can deliver what the ways that you actually are learning best and being able to track um, that. But we're a ways um, from, from, from that. And I agree with the gaming, you know, you just, you know, having kids and watching kids and, and seeing the trial and error, trial and error. Try, you wish that people would do that in, in classrooms as much as they do that and how many times they fail in a game environment. You're just amazing. It's okay to fail in that environment, but we're so fearful to fail because we don't put the structure in a classroom environment because not only faculty or my peers are going to think I'm silly, but in a game environment, you fail thousands of times before you. And I think that whole gaming, you know, philosophy is starting to make its inroads. Uh, there's been a lot, a lot of uh, universities have taken on a lot of that research about how do you get gaming into the education system. Right. So I think that once we start getting research of how do you implement that, um, and I think a little bit that's going to do with bandwidth and making sure that you can actually get that same type of gaming experience in an education environment. Ron, you think we're missing some elements here? No, I think all of these elements are part of the future. I think the, the notion of an enterprise system in education will be fundamentally different. And that in 10 years from now, we will be talking about a few progressive school districts, hopefully more, mm -hmm. that are run wholly on the back of an enterprise system that does the following. On a daily basis, it assesses where the kids are. It assesses how they learn, what they learn, right? And literally is almost a autopilot for a school district where there's real-time information being utilized on a daily basis to gather information and make adjustments. That is something that is not unique or, let's put it, there's not the ability of a human to do that 
as right. often as you need them to do it. And so you need a very sophisticated enterprise, not as we think about it today in K-12, which is where we gather all this information. And there's usually one office somewhere stowed away on some top floor of some big school district bureaucracy that crunches the annual reports from it. But it becomes a living, breathing um, system that's always adjusting for what's going on in the learning. I think that's one thing that we'll talk about. I think we'll also talk about, you know, hopefully in 10 years at a conference like this, is the few rock star districts where you had some progressive uh, school districts that weren't the worst, okay? That were decent school districts um, and decent by U.S. standards, right? So not, not terribly compelling, um, but decent where there will be unbelievable results for 90 plus percent of the kids in that system. And it will be leveraged by technology. And what we'll all be trying to figure out is what is replicable, mm -hmm. how do we replicate that, and how do we take mm -hmm. a school district that has rewritten the rules, right, and, 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 and make it work everywhere else, and how do the, the political barriers change to make that happen. One last thought on that, too, is I think there will be a greater and greater demand as these systems go for transparency for parents. So I think what we're also going to be seeing is today, in essence, the state of the art is parents can go online depending on how sophisticated the school district is and see what the homework, right. what the homework is, right? Not really compelling. You can ask Johnny to do your homework. In the future, I think there's going to be a real opportunity where parents are going to demand to know where their kid is relative to every other kid in that classroom, mm -hmm. how their teacher is to every other teacher in that classroom. Mm -hmm. Parenters is going to demand that because it's going to be available. That will serve as as much of a motivator for change in technology as anything else. Yeah. So for all these transformational changes that are going to happen by 2020, we need everyone's help in the room. And uh, we now need to shift to questions from the audience for a few moments. And I really want to uh, give a hand to our group already for their <laughs> contribution. <laughs> Questions. Identify yourself and then uh, speak out. Hi, it's me again, Brittany Reiner from earlier this morning. I love what you all had to say about education um, technology, and we've, you've talked a lot about the importance of teachers and how the frontal mode of teaching is not gone and it's still here. But what I'm curious about is what role you think education schools play in preparing the teachers of tomorrow. You talked a lot about uh, the students of tomorrow becoming more and more of a global citizen and at the implementation point of technology being once teachers are already in the classroom. But I'm curious as to what you think education schools can do to better prepare teachers to be more welcoming or hospitable to technology or to actually get them thinking about how they develop curriculum or leverage the technology solutions that you all are creating? So, can I go first? Or? Yeah, I, I, I want to put a plug in for Stanford and, and, and how they do this. So I, I, I graduated from here for, for business school, not in this nice campus, in the <laughs> other grosser campus that we used to be at. <laughs> Um, and, and my wife is actually now a student at the uh, Stanford School of Education. And one thing that I've seen, both from my experience in business school, when you know, we are encouraged to take classes in other parts of, of, uh, of, of the campus, and now what I, what I observe through her, where she's in this like, richly interactive mode of working at the School of Design and coming to the School of Business for classes and, and interacting with more than just people in her own department, is there this sort of very cool cross-cultural, cross-pollination thing that's going on at Stanford because it's not just about being a better teacher, it's about being an education entrepreneur. Um, if, if we could have our, our teachers be education entrepreneurs, I think that we'd be in a lot better place. So if anything, everyone should look at what the Stanford School of Ed and what the School of Business are doing over here and just duplicate it. Uh, we'd probably be in better shape. And just two, two, two things to add on to that real quick. You know, there are programs out there today, you know, I don't know, but I don't know what Stanford, in, in, in education technology leadership that right. are, you know, you see a, it's a growing degree that I see a lot more universities starting to offer be just because of this central issue is that, you know, we, we are educators. Uh, I think the other thing is, um, is understanding for the instructional design philosophy. How do you do instructional design? I mean, I think faculty over who've been teaching for a long time, you know, teaching their way, and, yep. and they, they give them, give this great lecture and the speech, and, and what, when you take things online, because you have to anticipate what's going to go on before the instructional design 
process and understanding the philosophies of, of instructional design actually will lead you to making better decisions on what technology you want to use in your classroom. So right, we're, we're getting news from the back room that we have one last question, so <laughs> wow. it's yours. Oh, I thought you were holding your mic. Okay. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this term, the frontal model, and I realize today we've been uh, experiencing the frontal model, haven't we? It's, uh, you've had us in the missionary position all day. So. The, uh, uh, I uh, am interested in whether, you know, this comment about uh, the advantages of greater fidelity or improvements in fidelity. Uh, something I've experienced recently is that my cable modem can't keep up with the demand in my neighborhood to even deliver YouTube videos, which of course are, have transformed my life for the better, and have the potential to transform the lives of our students and teachers for the better, but not if they can't get it delivered, because the infrastructure in our country has now fallen behind, you know, you name 12 other countries that have stronger digital infrastructure. Where are we going? Does anyone have information about where we're headed on that? Are we going to be falling increasingly behind the rest of the world with the opportunity to access these tools? that could be so valuable. Yeah, I don't have first-hand knowledge about what pipe they're laying at this point, but um, I do think, you know, you think about, you know, even the iPhone when they launched with AT&T, you know, it was a great example of, of, you know, great technology, great tool, and didn't have the strong enough pipe to be able to, to push. I, I think I mentioned this earlier in, in kind of this next 20 years. Um, it, it is a great point because we can innovate, but if the experience is average or below average, you know, I, you know I'm just going to be discouraged and I'm just going to distract from the learning because if it's slower to upload, you know, it's, it's blurry, it's things like that. So I don't know exactly um, in terms of the, you know, you know, the, the long-term plans in terms of laying down more bandwidth. Obviously, we see more of it, but um, it obviously is needed if you want to have this true online experience. Like, I know we have some folks from the federal government that you could speak to about at least what the government's doing on that, Jim Shelton among others. So thank you again very much. Thank and, you. I uh, really appreciate it. <laughs>